you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the 13 vampiric clans that rule this world of darkness. This episode will focus on the scholarly flesh shapers, Clan Zamitsi. Is it Zamitsi? Shimitsi? Zaimitsi? I've never been too sure how to properly pronounce the name of their devilish clan. They are not devil worshippers, mind you, but they certainly are fiends. They're the monsters from your nightmares, both as a mortal and immortal, and that is before you consider their uniquely horrific discipline, vicitude, which allows them to warp flesh and bone with their fingertips as if they were fondling some grotesque putty. The origins of this discipline lies with the clans found when he was a mage as a mortal, who was said to be able to commune with animals and eventually would learn to manipulate the elements as a canite. The gifts of this mortal were nowhere near as refined as it became in these modern knights, however. And who was this particular mortal? No one really knows, as the name of their clan's founder has been lost in time, as is the case with so many of the antediluvians. What I, and by extension other Canite scholars, know is that the Semitsis refer to their antediluvian as the Eldest, which is a simple but appropriate title for who is presumed to be the very first antediluvian. The Semitsi have one legend that they hold close to their inhumane chests, one that implies that the antediluvian was an experiment of Enoch, one of Cain's childer. It is said that Enoch, occasionally referred to as Nosh, the lawgiver, wished to rid himself of his vampiric impurities that tied him to the beast. It is said he did this by literally spitting it out onto the eldest in the form of an embrace. Those who study the path of metamorphosis claim this was an extremely modified version of the protein discipline. Enoch did intend to destroy his creation, but saw nothing outwardly monstrous, no more debased than his siblings anyway other than the fact that the flesh of the Eldest was now running like hot wax. The Eldest was welcome into this new family, but kept separate from the rest of his siblings. As a mage, he would naturally have a certain detachment from mortality. After all, one could learn the secrets of the universe, how things really work, not bound by the usual laws of science and mortality that you probably believed in as a kind. The eldest would then develop the same resentment of the other antediluvians, festering on the vision that it would eventually overtake these false demigods, which it saw as an afterbirth as Cain. It knew that its hunger would worsen, with nothing being able to sate it, and thus made its mission in unlife to unshackle the chains of the hunger. It would wander the earth both on foot and airborne, presumably as terrifying forms and incarnations beyond our mere insignificant imaginations. It meditated in philosophical seclusion, embracing child and the Carpathians during the deluge, not to numb some human loneliness, but to create more eyes to witness the mysteries of creation. Such child include, but not limited to, Yorak, Dracon, and Bylabog. The Carpathians you may be familiar with are a large mountainous system in Central Europe, mainly in Transylvania, Romania, and the Polish-Slovak border region. For the purposes of this discussion, the Carpathians is the name given to the fiends who lived there, and by fiends, I mean the aforementioned Methuselahs of Clan Zemitsi, the Eldest's childer. It was during this time that the Eldest encountered Kupala, a powerful demon that was left imprisoned deep within the bowels of the earth. How it got there is up for debate. Some say that it was by the might of werewolves who raged war over the demon, while some would say that it was the gods themselves. My belief that it is the former, for my associates in the East would inform me that Clan Samitsi still wages a private war with the Lupines to this day. The Eldest heard the demon's whispers and temptations, and sought this greater knowledge, a knowledge that would eventually become two fiends. Coldonism, the practice of Coldonic sorcery, and Kupala's sacred fire flower, also known as Kupala's heart. It is a legendary blood-red bloom and a key ingredient of the first ritual that made it possible to the Samitsi Coldons to break the blood bonds of their elders, thus giving birth to the ritual known as Volordery, which you know about from our discussion about the Sword of Cain, 
It is still practiced by the Sabat to this very night. The fiends would fight with the Lupines, presumably to free such demon from his imprisonment. It succeeded, resulting in Samitsi's vicitude discipline reaching incredible heights, one that would cut the clan in two, with one section embracing this new power, whilst the others refusing to practice vicitude at all, as they believed the eldest used this power to leech off the clan in an attempt to satiate the everlasting hunger mentioned earlier. These now ancient Samitsi would become known as Old Clan Samitsi. It is also with Kapara that the one clan weakness lies, which is that they must surround themselves with at least two handfuls of earth from a place important to them as a mortal. <laughs> Ironic, given how they choose to abandon their humanity so freely. And for your knowledge, this event involving Clan Samitsi, the breaking of the blood bonds, would eventually culminate in an event known as Kapala's Night. With the clan mostly free from the grips of Kapala, this surge of power came a newfound confidence, which is not to say the fiends were not confident by any means. The eldest's favourite child, Dracon, would adopt a more humane approach, literally using himself as a vessel to rebirth the eldest when it was slain by Samuel, found on the Salubri warrior cast, before bestowing the antediluvian to the mad and saddest Methuselah Yorak, who would form the infamous Cathedral of Flesh and tend to the eldest in Torpor. Yorak would manipulate the likes of Radu, Vladimir, Rostovich, and of Vladid Tepes, better known as Dracula, who all played the Game of Thrones much better than their sires and changed the premise that Samitsi could be powerful monarchs and not just incomprehensible metamorphosists. They would conquer Costanople and thus Rome, sitting high upon their wicked castles, unapologetic and unafraid as they bred the revenant families, laughing in the face of the mortals who fought back with crosses and garlic. Those who didn't fight back would eagerly feed their overlords their blood. <laughs> I imagine those Dark Age elders had to bleed themselves dry to make room for more. It is fair to say they grew drunk with power, as so many of the clans did as Samitsi sired mortals like rabbits, sending the fledglings and neonates into war with the mortals and the then new clan House Tremere, who are still their bitter enemies to this day. They also fought the Ventru, and Gangrels and their offshoot bloodlines, the Ander and the invading Asamites. This war tactic was not unique to the fiends, for all the clan elders sent their youngest to fight on their behalf, whilst the elders hid in their towers. Jihad. Jihad never changes. In any case, it was one of many fiends that contributed to the first Anarch Revolt, Kapal's Night, and the formation of the Sabbat. It also led to a Logjog Bloodbreaker drinking the blood of the eldest in the Cathedral of Flesh, following in the footsteps of their new La Sombra allies, who too ate their antediluvian. Both clans were heavily affected by the efforts of the First Inquisition, which makes sense, given the whole ethos of the Sabbat is not to shy away from your vampiric nature. They met on Majorca to properly assemble the Sabbat in its final form. The La Sombra would become the heart of the Sabbat, giving its structure and ensuring its survival the roles of Ducti, Cardinals, and Archbishops as a general rule of thumb. Clan Zemitsi would become the soul of the sect, attending what they would consider the high ideals of unlife, the intellectual and spiritual, later inventing the Volordery. It is probably this mindset why they are very much a clan in decline. <laughs> Anyway, they usually assume the roles of Prisky, Pact Priests, and Advisors. Like the La Sombra and the Sabbat in which they belong, the Clan Samitsi has a rigid hierarchy in factions that all command and demand revenants. It is not complex, but it is tightly bound in heritage, wisdom, and respect. The title of Voivod is assigned to the most powerful act of Samitsi, they must have the support of the other elders and display an advanced understanding of Koldonic sorcery and an empath of enlightenment. Zhupans are the wisest members, so it would be both rude and unwise to ignore them outright. To achieve this title, one must have awakened to their Zulu form, which I can only describe as a monstrous battle form that puts protein to shame. While all Samutsi consider themselves scholars, scientists, and sorcerers of sort, those who call themselves Koldons claim to be the first vampires to have mastered sorcery. I have mentioned it a few times now, but now would be a good time to further expand upon Samitsi's Koldonic sorcery. It is similar to Formaturgy in premise, but very different in practice. Koldonic sorcery requires the service of spirits of nature, rather than memorized rites and rituals. 
Cordonism tends to be much more subtle than Vormaturgy at lower levels, and Cordonism does not require so much an extension of will as a being a master of the very material a fiend wishes to manipulate. No vampire is embraced into Cordonism. Cordonic sorcery is always learned as an out of clan discipline. Despite being considered a form of blood magic, it generally requires no expenditure of blood by the caster. I spoke earlier of the old clan Simitsi, members of the Simitsi clan who did not join the Sabbat or cultivate the use of visitude. I believe they call themselves Dracul. Most of them are old, at least 500 years as they predate the formation of Sabbat, therefore of a low generation, and rule small domains exclusively in Eastern Europe. As such, it is fair to assume that those who don't join the Sabbat or submit to the Camarilla are either dead or void voids and thus the main practitioners of Coldonic sorcery. It would be worth remembering these terms should you find yourself in the company of one of these fiends. You may even have to seek shelter at their haven, which may sound like a terrible idea, but they make wonderful hosts actually. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? The right treatment of guests forms an indelible part of their culture. They follow many an archaic rule concerning deportment, manners, greetings, goodbyes, allowances, and settlement of grievances, but there are few clan-wide obligations that are always honoured. A guest of the Samitsi is entitled to several things. Shelter and nourishment for three days and three nights, not counting the night of the arrival. The protection of the host against third-party aggressors. Suspension of inter-family grievances for the duration of the stay the best quarters in the home of the host, up to and including the host's own chambers. But what if, if you find yourself a captive of an angry Samitsi, as I'm sure you're far more concerned about that than which bed you're going to get? I would start praying that they plan on killing you quickly, for they are master torturers. Now you see me no longer as the jester as I appeared to be a few moments ago. <laughs> The Samitsi disciplines vastly aid in torture. Vicitude allows the torture to become his own toolkit, reforming extremities, either theirs or your own, into a variety of intrusive implements perfectly shaped to the victim, or not, as the case may be. The sight of one's bones heaving of their own accord through one's skin is always disconcerting, and it becomes difficult to find a release in a scream when one's tongue has been grafted to the roof of one's mouth, with your teeth becoming one bar across your jaw. Then there are the other two disciplines at their disposal. Hmm, you forgot they had three, didn't you? Animalism allows for a variety of baneful creatures, particularly those of inspiring panic in the victim, to be summoned and precisely directed around, on top of, or even into the victim. And all specs can be used to drag your darkest secrets to hell and back. So what do you do if you encounter some meats in the open, on the field of battle? What sort of monstrosities can you expect there, besides what I've already described? In short, literally anything you can imagine. And they can imagine. The fiends craft their own ghouls outside of the Revenant families to act as shock troops and guardians. The most common of these minions are the Slacter, which are lobotomized as part of their birth. For lack of a better term. They are bestial creatures which are twisted caricatures of living creatures who only understand how to obey and kill. Then there are the Vosd. I advise you to run as fast as your little legs can carry you should you encounter one of these. They are, without a shadow of a doubt, terrifying titans created from at least 15 ghouls slapped together through visitude, blood sorcery, and about sadism that are used as omnivorous bombs. They point their creations in the right direction and watch their child play. And just to make matters worse, a Vosd is inhumane to animalism, dominate, and presence. Yep. Fortunately, they are not used all that much in the modern nights, what with media and the masquerade being prominent lifestyle choices for both mortal and kindred, respectively. Whilst I feel I have answered all of your questions concerning the fiends, I feel that one topic that has yet to be explored fully are the Revenant families, which is something I've picked up and put down a few times during our discussion. To my limited understanding, the Revenant families are families of ghouls maintained by the Samitsi, who serve as mortal pawns and possible candidates for the embrace. Centuries of infusions of vampiric blood and inbreeding have transformed the Revenants into a distinct type of supernatural creature that is neither fully ghoul or kindred. They produce a weak vampiric like vitae, which sustains their bodies far beyond average human lifespans, and also grants them the ability to use disciplines. 
Revenants are fantastically loyal to their vampiric masters and consider themselves superior to the average human, as well as their regular ghoul cousins. This, added to the treatment by the Sumitsi and their inbred, unsavoury lifestyles, have shaped their mindsets into completely alien directions. Most Revenants could never function as normal human beings. There are countless, diverse families the fiends embrace upon, but I know of a few that are perhaps the most popular amongst the fiends. The Brasoviches emerge only to hunt werewolves and other creatures of the night, in the addition of tracking for Sabat packs. They have the disciplines, animalism, fortitude, and vicitude. The Jocheski are rare for no longer serving the fiends, but Clan Tremir. It goes without saying how this pissed off their founder clan. They are meant to be good with tech and share the same disciplines as the Tremere. The Grimaldi are the Samitsi's primary liaison with human society. They are the most human of the Revenant families and are usually in charge of maintaining Samitsi estates and handling mortal endeavours like finance and politics. As such, they are probably one of the more independent families. They practice the disciplines, celerity, dominate and fortitude. The Santosas serve a similar purpose to the Grimaldi, but the Santosas are the main link to culture. They are self-indulgent social butterflies, on par with any Toreador in their dealings with human culture. They stimulate their senses and play with humans with reckless abandon. They are probably the revenants in the least control of themselves, even more so than the Brasoviches. And many believe that the only reason the Samitsi have not wiped them out is because they value their tradition and history. All specs, presence, and vicitude are their disciplines. The Orbitus are scholars and occultists, and they are held in high esteem by the Samitsi. Many a celebrated scientist, spiritualist, leader, and sorcerers have been embraced from their ranks. Their disciplines are vicitude, all specs, and dominate. You've gone pale. Here, drink this. I apologize if this has been a bit too much. Human family slaves, twisted abominations. It's all rather sick, isn't it? There is little one can do about it, however. If you were to call the Samitsi inhumane and sadistic, the Samitsi could probably commend you for your insight and then demonstrate that your mortal definition of sadism was laughably inadequate. The Samitsi left their human condition behind hundreds of years ago and now focus on transcending the limitations of the vampiric state. At a casual glance or brief conversation, a Samitsi appears to be one of the more pleasant vampire clans. Polite, and intelligent, they seem a stark contrast to the howling Sabat mobs and even the more humane Bruja or Nosferatu. However, on closer inspection, it becomes clear that this is merely a masquerade of their own, purpose to hide something far more alien and monstrous. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell as you will be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.